Now, let me challenge you here a little bit uh, on the likelihood of, of such a mission. Um, I recently interviewed Robert J. Sawyer. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he's a absolutely fantastic uh, science fiction author. He's the mastermind behind uh, TV series such as Flash Forward. Uh, he's won pretty much every uh, science fiction literally award that you can think of several times over usually. Um, and one of the uh, very powerful works that I uh, read by him recently is a trilogy called uh, WWW, Wake, Watch and Wonder. And it is about um, an emergen the emergence of a web mind, what he calls web mind, the emergence of this artificial intelligence, which emerges naturally on the internet. And uh, it's sort of interaction with the rest of humanity, uh, which is much of the time moderated by this blind, uh, brilliant uh, mathematical child prodigy girl who uh, is actually able to visually see the internet in, in a very specific way. Um, and then, so during that interview that I had with Robert J. Sawyer and during another event that I attended with him, he talked a lot about um, the last 200 years of science fiction, starting with Frankenstein, in which the idea has been the crazy scientist gives birth to his mind child, uh, you know, monster basically, that ends up killing either him or him and the rest of humanity. And then with respect to artificial intelligence, the three usual scenarios are the scenarios uh, of the Terminator, which is uh, the artificial intelligence basically exterminates us, the scenario of the Matrix, which they basically enslave us, uh, or, or make us basically like brains in a vat with sort of a virtual reality projected straight into our neocortex and then uh, fabricating a, a, an artificial reality for us while we are actually imprisoned. And then the last one is the assimilation possibility, which is the Borg scenario. In his opinion, however, the by far the most likely scenario is the one of friendly AI. And in, in that trilogy, he explores that possibility. And uh, there's a very serious and very strongly mathematically based uh, interaction uh, with respect to game theory and all that of the uh, reaction uh, of, say, for example, entities such as the US governments, which make numerous attempts to destroy and kill uh, that artificial intelligence because it's a threat to national security and it's a threat to the rest of the world because it's accelerating its progress so fast uh, that eventually it would become uh, God uh, Almighty almost. Uh, and all of those issues are being investigated in his work. And in his opinion, uh, the by far most likely scenario is a peaceful coexistence. And he goes through many, many reasons why an AI does not have an interest in uh, destroying us, but actually it's quite the opposite, the interest in preserving us and in the interest in, in us flourishing. Um, <clears throat> well, I haven't read his work at all. I've certainly heard this basic idea before. Um, unfortunately, I don't know what uh, particular game theoretic considerations he's using to make this prediction. Um, of course, we have to be careful not to generalize from fictional evidence, but instead make predictions about what AI will do from the math of decision theory and game theory and AI architectures, uh, and also the cognitive science of what we know about how human values are structured. Uh, and so when you do that, I think you're left with the conclusion that I gave earlier, which is that it's extremely difficult to specify what human preferences are because we evolved a thousand shards of desire that are often contradictory and you know you can read about the uh, three or maybe four systems in the brain that feed into the final common pathways for choice the model based model free and Pavlovian systems but that that's give precisely why he claims that's precisely why he claims that the AI would be different from us precisely because it did not evolve in a situation of scarcity in, in a situation of competition uh, for scarce resources in which it was basically kill or be killed, right? He says in a world of, in a virtual world, 
uh, with a virtual AI, you take care of the problem of scarcity, and, and basically you, you live in an environment of abundance. And therefore, I mean, that's only one of the many reasons, but therefore, because it didn't evolve uh, like we did, it, it is unlikely to have this competitive and, and sort of uh, uh, evolutionary biases that we are exhibiting. Right. It, it's very important. That I completely agree with um, most of that. The, the AI architectures, uh, we need to avoid anthropomorphizing AI. AI did not evolve with us and will not have the same kinds of you know, common sense or the same sets of preferences as we do, the same types of competitive drives. Um, instead, its drives will be determined by its utility function and the basic math of AI architectures. Um, the best paper on this is one from 2008 by Stephen Omohundro called The Basic AI Drives, where he analyzes what uh, convergent instrumental goals an AI will have. One of them is that it will want to, uh, AIs will converge towards having a utility function or basically being an optimizer, where it optimizes the world for its preferences, because that's the uh, sort of most powerful uh, type of AI to be. But there are other types of instrumental drives that an AI will acquire just in virtue of being an optimizer. One of them is that it will want to preserve its own existence because if it doesn't exist anymore, it can't optimize for its preferences. Uh, another is that it will want to acquire as many resources as possible uh, because with more resources, it can do a better job of optimizing the world according to its preferences. Another one is that it will want to remove threats to the fulfillment of its utility function. And uh, since humans don't have the same goals as the AI, uh, the AI will correctly recognize humans as a threat to its utility function, whether its utility function uh, says to uh, you know, solve the Riemann hypothesis uh, at all cost or do something else at all cost. Um, so there are particular reasons in the, um, the way that architecture, the AI architectures are set up and the way that utility functions work um, that lead me to believe that AIs will be by default dangerous. Um, it's correct. It's not because AIs evolved with us. It's because of the math of decision theory and utility theory. Uh, and, and I don't want to dispute all those possibilities at all. I'm a great sympathizer and, and a big fan of the work you guys do at the Singularity University. I mean, at the Singularity Institute. But I just wanted to suggest this as, as, a, uh, as something that you should investigate because I was not aware until very recently of, of those very thorough arguments. And I read the first book of the trilogy and I went ahead and I bought the second and the third one because it was just so fascinating, so hard science kind of uh, argued. It's, it's very logical, it's very mathematical, it's very hard science in some way. And in another way, it's very easy and accessible. So I would recommend that perhaps it would improve your arguments if you go through it. Yeah, I'll have to, um, you'll have to send me a link to his stuff to see if I can uh, find where those particular game theoretic arguments are so I can take a look at them. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so let's move on then um, to other issues such as, say for example, you've already mentioned that it's very important to support the Singularity Institute financially. But for others who do not have the capability to do so uh, with material terms, uh, then there's other venues. So how does one become an intern or researcher or in any other way associated with Singularity Institute to assist the work that you do? Yeah, there are many things that you can do. We have a large volunteer network of people who um, are able to assist according to the skills and talents that they have. And many people really find that satisfying um, because they think that the work we're doing is important and they follow our work and, and now they get to you know kind of interact with us and uh, work alongside us uh, on the mission. Um, so one way to do that is to email, uh, you can just email me even, luke at singularity.org or you can email our director of development, Louis Helm at louis at, sing, uh, at singularity.org. Um, but there are other things to do as well. Uh, I mean, in general, uh, it would be good for people to be exerting effort on improving their own abilities and capacities uh, so that they are more able to do whatever it is that they think is important in the world. And I think one very useful component of that is the rationality material that we 
uh, that we teach also at the Singularity Institute, which is basically, you know, how can you, it, it's so crazy. Humans are just incredibly irrational. We, <laughs> we know, like, for example, we know, oftentimes we know exactly what would be good for us to do to fulfill our preferences. Uh, and then we just don't do it. Or we, we do exactly the opposite. Or we do exactly the opposite. <laughs> like we know going on this particular diet would fulfill our preferences and then we just don't do it. It's absolutely insane. Uh, and so, you know, if we were anything like an AI, we would just all go on our diet, take the, you know, business classes and investing classes that we need to take, you know, study 80 hours, you know, pass all our exams, uh, become very wealthy and do whatever we wanted in the world. But we're not. We're primates and we have all these ridiculous heuristics in the brain that cause us to not fulfill our preferences. So uh, being aware of the particular ways in which your mind goes wrong and knowing which particular cognitive mental exercises you can use to uh, ameliorate those biases uh, can help you achieve your goals. But lots of other things are important too. I mean, uh, I often wish that a lot of people who were spending, too, I think there are a lot of people who maybe are spending too much time studying rationality when at this particular moment they should be studying social skills or business skills or something like that. So uh, sometimes the rational thing to do is to not study rationality so much but to study other skills. And uh, so I would encourage people to improve their own capacities, seek out people who can help you uh, get better. And this will be the kind of thing that will make you more useful as a volunteer to the Singularity Institute or m more useful as a collaborator with other organizations working on important things uh, or just better able to make a lot of money and donate to the causes that you think are most important. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, let me go back to the ideas here. Um, have your ideas and perception of artificial intelligence or the concept of artificial intelligence evolved from before you joined the Singularity Institute and after? And if they have, how and in, in what way? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they certainly have. My, my probabilities on things are constantly updating as I'm interacting with different researchers and uh, doing literature searches and pulling out different data on things. So my timelines for when I would predict different types of uh, and, uh, relevant technologies to arrive uh, have evolved over time. My, uh, my confidence intervals about when those uh, technologies would arrive have, have evolved. Uh, my understanding of the interaction between the different strategic issues has evolved. My understanding of the interaction between um, the different mathematical components of AI design have, has changed over time. Uh, probably more interesting than the evolution of my own ideas, though, would be the evolution of ideas about AI in the mind of Eliezer Yudkowsky, our founder and lead researcher, because he's been thinking about these ideas and posting his ideas publicly for over 10 years now. And so you can see that uh, he's changed his mind several times from what he thought in 1996 to what he thought in 2001 to what he thought in 2009. Um, so... Uh, yeah, the, you have to always update your beliefs in response to the data and the arguments that you encounter. And it's very important to be somebody who's able to do so. Um, and not just in a way where you verbally state that you're updating your beliefs, but then that you go on to make decisions that are consistent with your new beliefs and inconsistent with your old beliefs. Uh, and that's really important um, because we're not studying AI to get academic prestige and to get tenure and so on. We're studying AI because we think we have to get it correct or else bad things happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, we may not get a second chance. So we don't have the uh, opportunity to allow reality to beat us over the head with the truth like we often do in science where there's just we do enough experiments that there's an overwhelming amount of evidence we have to change our mind as quickly as possible and predict uh, what's true about the world so that we can get this right the first time